However, if the dangerous trends in our patterns of production and consumption are to be reversed, <coughs> a more radical understanding of what sustainable development in a green economy involves uh, is required. The Earth Charter's ethical framework helps to clarify the values, goals, and strategies that genuine sustainability supports and advances. For example, the Earth Charter principles envision a major overhaul of the global economy and free markets. Now let me turn your attention now to the text of the Earth Charter itself and some of the questions that have been arising over the past few years about the text. Periodically questions arise as to whether it's possible to revise the text of the Earth Charter or to add amendments and whether it be a good idea to do so. Questions of this nature have come up more frequently this year and the Earth Charter International Council has been considering these questions in the course of Earth Charter plus 10 uh, in its strategic review and long-range planning. The current situation is as follows. First of all, it is the Earth Charter Commission that has sole authority over the text of the Earth Charter. The Commission oversaw the drafting process, approved the final text, and launched the Charter in 2000. Following the launch of the Charter, the Commission turned over responsibility for the Earth Charter Secretariat and promotion of the Earth Charter, first to a steering committee, and then in 2006, to the Earth Charter International Council. However, the Commission retained its authority over the text of the Earth Charter. Up until this year, the prevailing wisdom has been that the text of the Charter remains basically sound. In addition, since it's been widely circulated around the world, translated into over 40 languages, printed in thousands of brochures, hundreds of publications, including encyclopedias, and endorsed by thousands of organizations, it could create great confusion if a new revised Earth Charter for some reason were issued by the Commission at some future date. Now, the addition of amendments rather than revisions of the existing text could avoid this problem to some degree. However, the Earth Charter is the product, as I mentioned, of a lengthy worldwide consultation process and any amendments would probably require international consultations. If a revised text were approved by the Commission, Earth Charter International would also probably have to start the endorsement process all over again. In the light of these considerations, if in the light of new developments there were compelling reasons to make significant amendments to the text, one could argue that the best approach would be to start a new international drafting and consultation process and create Earth Charter II or a new document with an entirely different name. Now what are some of the issues that lead people to raise questions like this? Uh, I want to share some of the information about this because it may be relevant to some of your discussions in the workshops and in the plenaries. First, the Earth Charter does not explicitly mention global warming or climate change. Now, this was discussed at length during the drafting process. It isn't as if the drafting committee and the commission forgot about this. Uh, however, there was much concern to keep the Earth Charter text as short and concise as possible. It was decided, therefore, that it was sufficient to describe the global situation in the preamble in very broad general terms and not to list all the specific problems like global warming, ozone depletion, deforestation, uh, overfishing, uh, and so forth. The long-range solution to the problem of global warming, furthermore, is the transition to a sustainable way of life. And the Earth Charter's ethical vision makes clear exactly what this requires in the way of basic values, patterns of production and consumption, and social and economic justice. The Earth Charter principles do provide general guidelines for building a green economy and mitigating carbon emissions. And they call for the kind of international cooperation that is being considered under the heading of adaptation in connection with global warming. In short, the Earth Charter's ethical framework can serve as a guiding framework for nations and organizations grappling with the problem of carbon emissions, mitigation, and adaptation. 
Now, the Earth Charter International Council and Secretariat has made an effort over the past two years to relate the Earth Charter to the international effort to negotiate a comprehensive climate change agreement in accord with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Recommendations designed to strengthen the ethical dimension of the long-range vision for cooperative action being drafted by governments was circulated by ECI and several council members attended COP15, uh, uh, the COP15 summit in Copenhagen last December. Now, seen, since expectations for COP16, which will take place in Cancun, Mexico, uh, later this year are not high, and since the Cancun meeting will probably be focused on rebuilding trust and a good process and a number of technical issues, ECI has not decided not to devote a great deal of time and effort this year to that meeting. But Mateo Castillo is here with us, and he's going to brief us at some point um, in workshops and certainly the council about uh, COP16. And uh, so we're looking forward to that presentation uh, from Mateo on COP, uh, COP16. Now in April, this is a, a second point. In April 2009, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution renaming International Earth Day the International Day of Mother Earth. From the moral and spiritual perspective of the Earth Charter, this acknowledgement by the United Nations General Assembly that Earth is the mother of the human family is certainly a very significant development. In addition, earlier this year, the government of Bolivia began circulating a draft universal declaration on the rights of Mother Earth. In light of these developments, Leonardo Boff, who is a member of the Earth Charter Commission and a leading Latin American liberation theologian, has, re has recommended that we rename the Earth Charter Carta de la Madre Tierra, or the Charter of Mother Earth. Now, the first official draft of the Earth Charter did refer to Mother Earth, in a principle on the rights of indigenous people. However, conservative Christian groups charged that this language indicated support for pantheism, which in the Christian tradition has always been regarded as a heretical um, worldview. In an effort to avoid controversial lang language, the Earth Charter Commission and the drafting committee decided to drop reference to Mother Earth, but to use the planet's name Earth with a capital E uh, and, and that's, in fact, what we, what we have done. Now, Leonardo Boff's argument is that the United Nations General Assembly's adoption of Madre Tierra, or Mother Earth, has dramatically altered the situation. He also finds that James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis, which is supported by a number of scientists, provides further justification for renaming the charter the Charter of Mother Earth. Now, while this proposal would be supported enthusiastically by most indigenous peoples and many in Central and South America, I do not know how it would be received elsewhere. The deeper question is whether it is a good idea to start down the road of making any uh, alterations in the text of the Charter. Now, let me give you one, one more example, and this is, I think, a particularly important one. Over the past few years, there has been increasing interest in the concept of the rights of nature, and more specifically in the legal rights of ecosystems and all living beings in addition to human beings. The appearance this year of the Bolivian Draft Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth has intensified interest in this issue. These developments have led some individuals to suggest that the Earth Charter be revised to include explicit support for the rights of nature. In addressing this issue, I'd like to begin by providing for you a little more information on the origin of the draft Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. Under the impact of global warming, the glaciers in the mountains of Bolivia are melting, threatening the nation's water supply. This situation, together with the larger challenge that global warming presents the developing world, has led Professor, excuse me, President Evo Morales to try to mobilize international support to pressure the developed nations to take strong action on climate change. 
Toward this end, he hosted last April the World's People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. The conference brought together 30,000 people from many different nations. Agreement on a draft of the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth was part of the agenda of the World People's Conference, and the assertion of the rights of Mother Earth is part of Bolivia's strategy to promote international action that dramatically reduces greenhouse gas emissions and provides financial and technical assistance for developing nations as they address mitigation and adaptation. The Bolivian government is seeking support for this new universal declaration among uh, the Latin American governments and the members also of the G77 with the goal of eventually securing endorsement by the UN General Assembly. Now, led by the environmental philosopher Thomas Berry, a number of groups urged the drafting committee when we were in the process of creating the Earth Charter to incorporate language about the rights of nature in the Earth Charter. However, the Earth Charter Commission and Drafting Committee concluded that there was not a wide consensus on extending the use of rights language in international and national law, and therefore the Charter does not adopt this approach. It is important, and this is a very important point, it's important to recognize that the Earth Charter is very clear in addressing the fundamental ethical issue that motivates advocates for the legal rights of all living beings. The Charter affirms respect for Earth and reverence for life and asserts that all living beings should be given moral consideration. This is the underlying issue. The drafters of the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth were well aware of the Earth Charter and its significance in this regard. Cormac Cullinan, the lead drafter of that Universal Declaration, explains in his commentary on the text that, and this is a quote, the Declaration is intended to complement rather than supersede the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the Earth Charter. He notes that the Declaration, and again I quote, is wholly compatible with the fundamental principles reflected in the Earth Charter. So the debate over the concept of the rights of Mother Earth is over whether the best way to promote respect and care for the community of life is to use rights language as a legal mechanism to enforce compliance with these and other ethical principles that call for the uh, care and protection of the larger natural world. The Earth Charter establishes the ethical foundation for doing so, even though it does not endorse this particular strategy. The advantage of using language about the rights of all living beings in the law, as well as in environmental philosophy, is that it is readily understandable and potentially a very effective way of clarifying and implementing the practical meaning of the principle of respect and care for the community of life. There are, of course, other entirely workable legal pro approaches to regulating human relations with the larger natural world, and one finds them already well established in existing legal systems, such as treaties on the protection of endangered species and laws prohibiting cruelty to animals. Now, a serious international debate over using rights language to protect animals and ecosystems is only just beginning. The major contribution the Earth Charter can make is to help marshal and secure international support for the underlying ethical principle of respect for Earth and all life. If the Earth Charter were to be amended so as to support the idea of the legal rights of nature, it would greatly complicate the effort to win governmental and business support for its ethical vision. Further, under the present circumstances, it's easy for a person to support both the Earth Charter and the rights of Mother Earth if they choose to do so. Now, regarding the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth itself, it is my view at this juncture that ECI should encourage the careful study of this document and a full international dialogue on the advantages and disadvantages of using the concept of legal rights as a mechanism to protect Earth's ecological integrity and promote care for life. 